and welcome to another edition of Grandstanders Live. My name is Scott Kerman. I'm your host, and I'm joined, as usual, by my usual cohorts. Russ Stevens on my left, Uncle Joe McLaughlin on my far right, and our special guest tonight is, in my opinion, and many, many others, the greatest sports journalist of all time in the New England area. He has entertained us, educated us, and enlightened us for the last 44 years as the main sports writer for the Boston Globe. He has just, uh, in the last week, been awarded the Red Smith Award for excellence wow. in, um, in journalism. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. He's the one and he's the only Bob Ryan. Good evening. Thank you for joining us yes. here in the well, grandstand. So much, with that Bob. said, I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a pleasure topic. having you on. We really do appreciate Thanks, it. You're welcome. Um, we have a lot of Bob. We have a lot of young people who watch <clears throat> the show, uh, and they, they've never had the pleasure of seeing <clears throat> one of the true Boston sports legends of all time, one Larry Bird, play live. Yes. Now, I also need to mention that he was a Brookline resident. Yes, Gotta he put was. That in. Um, so, Bob, what made Larry Joe Bird so unique and so special? He saw things before they happened. Uh, it was, he was so analogous, and it, and it was compared to and became friends with Wayne Gretzky. They became, uh, they were, they were in, reaching their apex at the same time. In fact, they shared a Time magazine cover uh, in, in their prime. Uh, because the great thing about them was that they weren't the best athletes in, in their sport. No, they weren't even close to it. Weren't even close to the best athlete on their team. If you're going to define athleticism, it's running, jumping, etc. But there's so much more to athleticism. Hand-eye coordination, uh, game intuition, uh, anticipation, uh, and so forth. Um, and they both had it better than anyone else, uh, certainly at, at, their, in, at their time. Uh, also, in Larry's case, he had a... Um, a, a connection with fans that I've never seen any other basketball player have. Now, uh, in, uh, in certainly in the, in the 45, six years now that I've been around, uh, it, there was no, nothing like his ability to connect with fans, to have people feel uh, with him and, and have people, I, I think, think, you know, I'd like to go have a beer with him. Uh, and, and, and just he was so eminently rootable because he, they, they knew he wasn't the best athlete, but they saw what he accomplished and how he did it and how hard he worked. And, 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 and how uh, clever he was, and, and, and they just related to him, and he related back to them. He learned how to use the media, particularly, uh, to get to the fans. And, 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 to, um, and he really believed that the home court mattered because the fans were their, their, the sixth man. And whether it's a lot of hooey or whether it's a, but they, he believed it. What, oh, go ahead. You know, he had a, he had a, uh, I remember, I believe you wrote a column at one point in time talking about, he came in as the, Fren the, the hick from French Lick, yeah. Yeah. and he became a very, uh, articulate yes. um, public speaker in, in his own way. And yes. he, was descri he would describe plays mm. or describe dynamics of a game in ways that made us well, all well, sort of right. say, wow. Uh, and circa 1988, I, I uh, pitched an idea to the Globe for the Sunday Magazine, a story on the, the blossoming of Larry Bird. Right. Exactly what you were talking mm. about, having come in wary, hostile, suspicious, uh, a, a thought to be mm. uh, not too bright, uh, not too aware, uh, the, and, and uh, the, the so-called Hicks from French Lick, and then to emerge into this league spokesman, this uh, number one, and, and uh, the savvy uh, guy who, who, who had the whole big picture in total focus with, with his team and the, and the league, and that how he learned to handle the media uh, after the game. And, and he just said it was just so, so uh, almost amusing to him when he realized how long, uh, how much time we're talking about. And, and he said he'd go in and to the uh, press room, I mean, to the uh, locker room after the game, take a look at the clock, and, and uh, know that um, if he answered the question straightforwardly and did his job, it'd be about 12 minutes. Because hmm. he knew that people had jobs to do. He right. knew they had to get out of there. You need your answers. You get your questions, your answers. You got to go right. And, so he and knew your he, job as and well. And he didn't yeah. mind that. He didn't mind that at all. He said, and he got to like it. And he really came out during the playoffs. And, and he peaked in 87 and 88, yeah. those two playoffs, particularly 87, when they lost to the Lakers. Uh, and Kevin McHale was hurt. And he was blunt and honest and said, if I were Kevin, I wouldn't even be playing. You know, right. he, he had no Is filter right? and yeah. things like that. Yeah. And um, he, he was, uh, but and he also, the fact that he was growing up in, in, in the big, wide, beautiful world outside of Orange County, Indiana, uh, and realizing that uh, he, he kind of wasn't comfortable with the big world and he wasn't mm -hmm. sure he was going to be. And I, I kidded him during that story 
uh, I, I said, Larry, you guys, we just talked for a half hour and you didn't use one double negative. <laughs> and and you know, he, he had a laugh because when he would go home in those off seasons, he had to revert back to being who they wanted him to be. Right. And, and they wanted him to be Larry Bird that, that they knew, who was the all shucks, you know, the, old, yeah. the, 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 the good old boy kind of person, rather than, frankly, this reason, the very sophisticated person that he had evolved into back here. So he had to shift gears when he went home, dumb himself down to please, to, to please everybody at home. The whole Moses Malone eats blankety blank in what eighty one. Yeah, that was eighty one right? at City Hall yeah. Plaza. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's when he realized how much he loved it. Uh, he said, and, and I remember when we did the book uh, in, in eighty seven and in eighty eight, and uh, he was talking about how much he got such a kick out of those championship celebrations down at City Hall Plaza, and he enjoyed to be standing out there, you know, looking like the Pope at the at, at St. Peter's right. Square, right. Right. Waving, out of his hands. waving to the crowd and yeah, and, really and, and orchestrating. The crowd. Yeah. He really enjoyed yeah. it, and this is a, a a Larry Bird that he was surprised yeah. to discover existed. Was he the patriarch of the 1992 Dream Team? I mean, he was a guy whose obviously skills, because of his injuries, had diminished. At that point, right, everybody knew that it was ceremonial. That he belonged on the team. He and Kim Magic were, were appointed co-captains immediately, and yeah. and um, uh, that that was evident. Magic was coming back from the HIV. He was coming back from. He was hanging on. You know, that was was to be his last year. And and uh, in fact, he had the. He was really concerned that he could even get over there, that he could even fly across the Atlantic. They had to lie down. I mean, he had the back was in in, in very bad shape. But, yes, he wanted desperately to be on that team. He he really was so proud to be a part of it. Uh, And, yes, he was. He and Magic, I'd have to say the two of them. They were, and they and they had that kinship, and it's all real. It was real then, and it's real now. And when I was so happy when we did the book uh, that um, you know Magic uh, did the forward, and uh, and and it was you know it was very appropriate. Now we think of Tommy Heinz, and obviously the young generation thinks of this kind of grandfather-like figure, yeah. you know, very funny, very cartoon-like yeah. almost now. But, but, but you have Stone. you have a right. very different relationship when you started writing yeah. with Tommy Heinz and covering the South. I did, and when it started out, it was great, and it, it eventually became a little bit adversarial because uh, a coach has, this, has his um, uh, uh, turf and a writer has his job. And, um, but it started out, he couldn't have been more accommodating. First of all, consider when he started out in 1969, he was 35 years old, had been retired for five years, and had never coached a second of anything in his life. Not even a peewee league, not a youth league, not a bitty basketball, nothing. He had never coached. He was named coach by Red Auerbach. He had, he was a, in the interim, he had been a broadcaster and a highly successful insurance salesman. He was like an award-winning insurance yeah, salesman. And he sold the policies to everybody on earth from Bill Russell on down, Auerbach, and he was, that, that's what he did. Right. And then he, he, he did a, the color, and they didn't do all the games. You know, in fact, they didn't come on television. Uh, uh, for, you know, they were on 56 for a while. Then they came on 27 right. in Worcester right. uh, with Bob Foraker, <laughs> if you remember that. And you didn't cover the away games yeah. at times, no, right? No, oh, no, we didn't. Those days, you didn't, the, the, uh, the beat people didn't travel only in the playoffs, except in the playoffs. So the first year, the first couple of years, actually went, almost went on for three years. Um, well, I, I, well, the first two years, when they would go on the road, um, if he would – after the game, it was just like a high school, just like any local high school. He would call me back. He would call me after the game so I could do my PM story. I would write the game story. If it was on television, I'd write it from TV. If it was not on TV, God forbid, I would write it from Johnny Most description of the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and you had to do that. And then for your Evening Globe, remember we had a separate paper. Yeah, that's right. For your yeah. Evening Globe story, Tommy Heinsohn would call back, and then I would write a story based on his observations or whatever he's going to tell me about the game. That would be my PM story. That it's so unimaginable for any writer or anyone listening to here today to think that that can you imagine Greg Popovich calling back to the San Antonio <laughs> Press no. uh, after a game? Uh, pa- uh, no, I can't quite do that either. But uh, that's <laughs> no. exactly what what he did. Now, as time went on, there were inevitably there were going uh, there were conflicts about p- opinions. I developed my sources with the team. He kind of thought that he had developed me and therefore kind of had a proprietary pr- proprietary hold on me, and I. I appreciated my relationship with him, but I also had one with the players. And it turns out there were differences of opinion on certain things. And uh, it led to some conflict. And in the end, it led to some real conflict. By the seventh year I did it, 75, 76, during the playoffs, uh, it had really gotten real bad. And I realized that the next year, if we came back, if I had come back, the next year was not going to be pleasant. It was going to be difficult. Uh, we were going to be adversarial. That wasn't going to serve anybody's purpose, certainly not the reader. And I, was, I, I, I thought I needed to step away, and I did. And, and so we eventually, in 1978, uh, we were at a, a testimonial dinner for his old roommate, Jim Luskatov. 
And I went up to him at the bar and said, hey, would it spoil your evening if I said hello? And he said <laughs> no. And that was in 1978, and I can tell you 37 years later, we've been friends. Very, and I've got it hanging magic. proudly in my living room, a Tom Heinsohn painting. As you probably know, yeah. he is a gifted artist. Yeah, very and, much. Um, um, I'm very proud to have a Tom Heinz in my living room, and, and we're, we're quite compatible, we're quite friendly, uh, but we needed to get away from the day-to-day. -day. But before we leave this, uh, uh, and this is sort of the, the modern version of having a conversation with uh, a Heinz after the game, I think. You, you sent a tweet out, which you don't do very often. A uh, tweet in spurts. In spurts. And it must have been about a week or two ago, and, you, and the tweet pointed to a fascinating article in Grantland on oh, that was the good. Oklahoma City... Uh, the press, the press's relationship, with, the Oklahoma City press's right, with relationship Durant. with the with the specifically team. with Durant and secondarily with Westbrook, but specifically yeah, with and Durant. You, I was wrote shocked a, when I read you wrote about a lot about that. In yeah, the book. Well, it's a very interesting uh, thing. Uh, that these things, um, uh, the way the world is now, is the, the the kind of the access is so restricted. Um, you don't get to know them. You don't travel with them. We, you know, we traveled, literally traveled together. You know, we went to the airport. We checked in together. We rode the plane together. When we got to the city, we got on the bus and rode to the hotel together. We went out to eat together. went out to drink together. The next day, we got on the bus to go to the game <laughs> together. They waited. A lot of times, they waited until we finished writing uh, uh, and before the bus left the arena to go back to the hotel. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you, you really live with them. Uh, now, you know, nobody travels together. They, the media goes one way. The team charters. Uh, that This is before charters. No one yeah, chartered in right. those days except the Knicks, and then not all the time. But in this, this, this day and age, everyone charters, and you don't stay at the same hotel, and, and really, your, your access is limited. But the Durant, uh, yeah, this is an interesting thing, how it's evolved. Uh, Durant has just got, uh, uh, it's just a shield. Uh, it, 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 but they all have them. And, uh, but the thing is, it's a benign press in Oklahoma City. Yeah. It's a very benign right. press. This <laughs> isn't Philadelphia. This right. isn't New York. It's not Chicago. It's not. It's it's not Boston. It's Oklahoma City, and this is like the high school team, the local high school yeah. team, and and um, yet there's this. You know, there's forces. There's agents and 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 relatives and and other and, and and they don't need the media. You know, they don't need the old days. The idea was the media helped sell them to the public. Maybe helped get them endorsements by presenting right. their case, their their personalities. They don't need that. They can go right to the public now. The right to, with with tweeting or yeah. any way they want. Yeah, but it was Instagram, interesting. It you but read that. The thing is that the, yes, Durant shocked the world during the All-Star game when he lashed out at the media, and you guys don't know, you know, bleep, and uh, uh, you shouldn't be voting for awards and, uh, and lots of stuff. And, and he had been, this is like, this is like having your friendly uh, Labrador retriever turn into a pit bull. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Right. And we, no one was ready for this. And, and he'd been harboring all this. And he said, I'm going to start, I've been always saying things you want to hear. Well, that's fine. Who told you to do that? No one told you to, not right. to be yourself. Right. But, but people, well, I mean, we can, go, we can go on and on and on about Durant. Yeah. But you have to remember, he had a very specific uh, background. Uh, um, of of, of uh, family life was was predictably tumultuous. Uh, mm -hmm. Went to like four different high schools. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's he's, he's so really didn't issues. grow. He oh. didn't grow up yeah. with uh, you know with with organ with organization, if you will. Yeah, you when know? he accepted the MVP award, he oh, always won everything. Came yeah, out everybody he had this tears. Yeah, for really? minute, all of a sudden, you know, oh, I didn't you remember know he showed yeah, up, but he was showing up at the press conference with the backpack, and the Bible was in the backpack, and he was humble and sweet. And it's like he's now he's telling us it's all an act. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I, it, it's there's yeah. a lot more going on there. You know, he, he's he shooting his way out of town to get to L.A. Well, and that's the other thing. You know, but I mean, I, I think he's an essentially fine person, but I just think he's he's just really it's just it, just in a in a whirl right now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. My, but my impression of Russell Westbrook was my bubble was popped there. I I, I totally had the. The wrong impression. Yeah, I had nothing. I had no impression. I had no feel for Westbrook. I don't know anything yeah. about what make him yeah. tick at all. And yeah. he just seems like but, the but, world's but, but, but biggest. But Durant, we thought people thought was just wonderful, sweet, humble, yeah. shy. And I don't. I think he is. Uh, well, we didn't know the one thing he had always said. He was tired of finishing second. Remember that one? Yes. A couple yeah. years ago, right. tired of finishing. I didn't right. win in high school, and, and and you know we didn't win in college, and we got to the finals and didn't win. Well, that's fine. I can understand that. Sure. But that's as close as he had ever come to to sounding contrary. Right. Before all this. Now, in the book, you know, you talk about John Halvacek, and to be honest with you, he's one of the great Boston sports athletes that kind of has gone off the radar. Maybe yeah. because he's not a big personality. He's still alive, still well. Always very well. Yeah, yeah. and yet you started, you know, describing him, no. describing what kind of player he is. And can you please just tell the audience what John Halvacek meant to the Celtics organization and what a great player he was? John um, Halvacek 
came in, uh, first of all, in a very good circumstance in that he didn't have to be more than he was capable, uh, do more than he was capable of doing as a young player. He entered a team that was winning, about to win its sixth straight championship or sixth championship in seven years. And he um, only had to play defense and went up and down the floor and on, on a fast break. And then he made himself into what I consider to be the best player of his time, a better player at his peak than Oscar Robertson, better player than Jerry West, a two-position player, by far the best two-position player we've ever known at guard forward. Yeah, you can argue center forward. You could say McHale, and I, I would give you. I would argue that. But guard forward, uh, the best guy since him is Scottie Pippen, and and Scottie Pippen was a great player. He's a Hall of Fame. He's a dream teamer. He was not as good as John Havlicek. So let's get that straight right now. Um, <laughs> there was nobody like John's extraordinary uh, uh, endurance thing. You know, right. um, once, but, he, but he had two different lives. He was the best six man in the history of basketball, out of, uh, and that was a luxury the Celtics could afford. Right, right through the end of the 68 right. 69 season, they could afford to bring him off the bench uh, because they had so many good players. And they won this final, they won that championship in 69. But guess who led the team second in minutes played for like the last four years of those? John Havlicek. So though he didn't start the game, he always finished the game. Mm, right. And was averaging in the low, high 30s, early 40s. Then, when Bill Russell retired, Sam Jones retired, and he's now having to carry the team, what does he do? He leads the league in minutes played. He's playing 45, 46, 47 minutes a game uh, routinely, every That's night, crazy. Two, and, and, not, and running the floor from no. end to end, as, as, no rest, and running, right. running uh, uh, the best up without the ball player of his time. And like a 48 and, heart and, rate <clears throat> per, right. per minute, something, and, something and crazy. Then, and it's a true story that when he had a um, um, chest X-ray, uh, at one point, they had to put an extra plate in because his lungs were too big for the one plate. Oh, yeah. So he it's was like a physical freak. You know, yeah. He would be up. on board. He'll, yeah. he'll right. tell you, you know, he'll, he'll happily, you know. He's his a, resting happy was like 18. He's a physical freak in that regard, and, and he took full advantage of it. But um, the, um, uh, he, he, was, he was just, he was, imagine when, when other coaches would have to give their star a blow in the second period, John would still be out there. Tom right. Heinsohn, and, and uh, particularly Heinsohn, who, had, who got the, it's the one who had to have him as a starter, and for whom you know he then played his last seven years, um, or his last yeah most of his last seven years, um, he he had the luxury of having John Havlicek available forty seven eight minutes a game, whereas the other stars were available forty, and and um, you know, there's nobody to compare him to today. There uh, certainly not today. The guys that people have cited as they come along, uh, and then you know you laugh now you you don't want to embarrass them, but the comparison Dan Marley for a while was considered right, yeah. he was good. Yeah. I mean, but it's like for triple A. He right. was a triple A Havlicek, and then only for about three years. Yeah. Right. He lo he's long gone from the league. He didn't have a long career. And uh, um, it's Pippen, people say Pippen, and I'm not going to not. Pippen's a great player, but that there's a quality about John uh, that that you know. First of all, uh, I you know Pippen lost me forever when that when he episode when he wouldn't. Yeah. Right. Take the last shot. Wouldn't go in the game because he wasn't going to get the last shot. Right. You know that thing, and and they, uh, you know that that that. Now, sorry, we don't need that. There's an there's another player we've one of a kind. I know when you bust out the sui generis, mm. you you really mean it, mm. right? And there's mm. another player that you've called uh, one of a kind, and we've talked a lot about over the last few weeks is Rondo. Rondo, right? Rondo will be the most debated, I think, uh, Celtic of consequence ever. It, yeah, and and, it, and and looking at the way he's going now, we're starting to wonder what do we ever see in him. I mean, he is so he right. is so ineffective and so uh, ordinary right now in in, in uh, Dallas. Uh, you know, they're they're I mean, they're not so happy. They're, right. they're saying, what do we you know what, we invested in this? He's not he's not doing much for Dallas at all. Uh, it's an odd game. It was always an odd game. Right. And then of course you throw in the odd personality on top of the odd game. And and I guess they go they they go together, but um, um, I'm not. He did some extraordinary things and playing well. He he was so, was he fun to watch? Oh, absolutely. Sure. I mean, I can still see him going to the hoop. I love the way he went to the hoop. I love those those little ins and outs and back ins and outs and right. and all that. Um, and his his rebounding and his triple doubles and and some of the stuff he did was extraordinary. But. Uh, uh, there was but he doesn't take it to the, you know, it, it seems like in this day and age that if you're, a, if you're under 6'6 six, six, mm -hmm. and you can't get the ball to the hoop or hit threes, right? And then you, you throw you, in the free throw shooting. And he can't, you can't so he doesn't have, go to the hoop anymore. You because can't have your point guard shooting uh, abysmally from the free throw line yeah. as if it were, you know, a miniature yeah. DeAndre Jordan. Right. Right. And right now his free throw shooting is the worst it's ever been. It's never gotten better. So it's leading you to think now as he approaches 29 years old, I think he, he's not going to get any better. Right. He's not going to get better. This is it. He's peaked. You've seen the the ceiling. So, but uh, the young, you know, I, I, I yeah. But I, I thought certainly the the other guy that will always be debated, you know, was was Antoine. 
you know, and young people. Sure, lo- yeah. That was such a generational thing. Yeah, I <laughs> that was such an <laughs> incredible. Really I mean, that seems like the dark years. Yeah, and that was a generational yeah. thing, you know. But he had some. I remember writing a column after we had a great game in in Indiana in the playoffs, say, saying, you know, this, the, you know, the, the good on the good Antoine showed up, you know, not the bad Antoine, you know. But you're yeah. never sure which one you were going to get. But he was debated. But uh, I think Rondo is going to be debated forever so. and ever. Well, we've seen a different Brad Stevens since Rondo has gone. Yeah. I mean. Clearly a happier Brad Stevens. <laughs> that's, a great, um, that's a great point. You know, I think that it was either Brad Stevens or Rondo. Well, you know, Doc, and I used to talk, and Doc it was careful. And I had a good relationship, a very good relationship with Doc. And all he would say to me about Rondo, here's all he would claim, you know, was, was you don't know what you're going to get day to day in practice. You know, one day you get, a, you get a, a, a certain personality, the next day you get another personality. Claimed he got along okay with Rondo, but I happen to think he was, I, I happen to think he was, uh, uh, when he was happy to be 3,000 miles away from Rondo when he left here, I think. You, you had mentioned that in your book uh, that you love college basketball because of the, everyone's 6'5 tweeners. Yes. Okay, so <laughs> isn't, doesn't that describe right now the current Celtics as we speak right now? They're all 6'5 tweeners? Well, you know, like Jay Crowder, you know, who's a 6'7 Amazing. tweener, but he's right, a 6'7. Yeah. yeah, there's guys like that. Um, uh, Turner. Turner's a, yeah. you know, he, he, once again, we're talking 6'7 here, but Turner's an interesting hybrid player. And when he's playing well, like as, as he did Monday night, when he had that mm. really mm. impressive triple-double, yeah. because that was really a work of art that <laughs> night. Yes. Um, uh, he, he's good. But I do love, see, that's what I love about um, all levels of college. If you go to a Division three game, there'll be some 6'3 inside guy that can really right. play. Can get and to you know league. he's not yeah, going right. to be, and, 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 and he knows like, how to play. Yeah. And if you go to his Division two game, there'll be some 6'6 six, six guy. You know, he does not a great athlete, but he knows he's got his footwork down. He has a nice little jump hook. He's got an up and under. Um, he knows how to play. And and I love those kind of guys. And, and, and I always look for those kind of guys in college. Um, I'm trying to think um, right now. I'm just trying to think if there's anybody – well, you know, he's, a, he's not really that kind of player, but right now is one of my most intriguing college players right now is Pat Connaughton. Uh, 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 you know, he's 6'5". He's their best rebounder. He can make threes. He can make a play. He hustles. He's not we, – now we know he's going to play baseball anyway. But let's say – but he loves – but he'll, he would never make the NBA, I don't think. But, the, with this, but right. I would rather watch these kind of guys play than some of these so-called great athletes, you know, that, that are good enough to play in the NBA but don't have a complete game. Right. Where um – we were talking about this the other day. Where do you think, given the flow of things with the Celtics now, the the next star is going to come from? Is it going to come from a draft? Is it going to no. come from a trade? Is it going to come from a free agent? Well, right now, the, you know, the the, the 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 face of the team that it's he's been anointed, and he's not ever going to be a star. And I've never played an All Star game, I don't think. But he's going to be their heart and soul with Smart. They they are absolutely mm. again you you. Brad Stevens, Danny, adore, they just love this really? kid, and you should love this kid. Uh, he does things every night on defense, at least a couple of times that 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 uh, they just can't. You know, they, they're so exciting. He's I, I see a little bit. There's a little DJ in him. He's got that kind of toughness. Sure. There is it's a little DJ in him. Um, he's 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 going to be the leader. Now they've got they're going to pitch their wagon to Isaiah Thomas uh, uh, as a part of the. The, the ongoing process. There's no question in my mind they want him to be part. If they turn the corner, they want him to be part mm-hmm. of it. They're not using him as a chip. Um, I, they, I, I don't know beyond that. You know, I, I know they'd love to. Th- we still, where is, what's going to happen with Sullinger? Right. Is he ever going to get healthy? Ever. Or is it going to be this continual it's, tease? It's one thing after another. It with is, him, right? you know, and, 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 and now he's talking about admitting he weighed 300 pounds earlier. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I can understand. But I love when he's playing well, you like him. I like Olenek. I think there's a limit, obviously, but the Olenek can be part of a rotation of a, of a, of a very good team. Do you think Doesn't Olenek, when you see him, don't you, can't you see him with the Spurs? Uh, yeah. Can you see him with the Spurs? That's, that's my Seventh benchmark. Man, I'm not a big fan of Olenek. That's my He's, benchmark. Okay, right. that's my benchmark with, with anybody. Mm. Can this guy play for the Spurs? Yeah. Uh, right. Or, 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 or would Popovich can. give him the time of day? Do, and if, do you that, think that's that, my benchmark. Do you think you that... Know, really? I, 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 uh, but, go ahead. Why? I, I just think you know, he doesn't give the extra effort that you need. I think Brad Stevens is just Especially disgusted with him at times. He doesn't do anything rebounding wise. He's he's very soft. He's he's soft, but he's but but he's a fact. You know, you saw when you see him play Monday night. You know, and he makes and the shots going in, and he and he's going. You know, he had 18 points casually off the bench. It looked like nothing. And I, well, okay, we can have we can do can table. Well, yeah, that he's one. a good change of pace guy. Bring him in. We can table that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The uh, our, so on the on the current Celtics. To answer your question. I think that it's misdirection in the draft. In the draft. Okay. The so it's not not not, not yeah, likely to be a free so. agent. I mean, I right. think they're still they have to get a higher level of talent. I mean, what yeah. they have now could yeah they may scrape into the eighth spot. 
or the seventh right. because right. it's so congested. Yeah. Right. Doesn't matter. You know, they're, they're, you know, those teams are all bunched, and and it's going to go down to the last game or two for for four teams. You know, or five: Indiana, Charlotte, right. Miami, Miami. Uh, themselves, yeah. and Brooklyn. Somebody. Brooklyn's in the yeah, mix. I yeah, think I mean, even a little so bit. So it's all going to come down to the last uh, few days. It's going to be very exciting, yeah. and and whoever plays is you know, going to go out in the first round. That's fine. The point is, they had they need to improve the talent base. Uh, you know, um, and the question is, who is it? Who are the keepers? You know, that's uh, that's a question. Could they? Could this back? court be a backcourt the four of them yeah. so thomas smart bradley, bradley and turner yeah right could they compete could That's they a compete question. for a for for a league probably, championship my get, not probably, the nba championship probably or, not i know I, I'm, not quite and right when you mentioned bradley bradley to me is the ideal third guard right ideal third guard and he's really getting that shot down now too is it but he's not a you know he's not a quality two guard he's a he's a good he's, he's a good solid or he's a good hybrid player he's still a one a one and a half it's yeah. like that red sox rotation they've got a one yeah smart they, yeah. and then they've got three so, threes. that's a good question but I, uh, and and it is a quandary because none of them have enough trade value that somebody would give you a lot for them even though right. they could help a lot of people they all could help somebody you know uh, Turner, I don't know what happened in Indiana. I'm still trying to figure it out because we see how he can play. Larry told me, I talked to Bird before the season. He said, you're going to like him. Really? It just didn't work here. And he didn't elaborate. And, and hmm. it didn't work here. But he said, you're going to like him. And, and you can see a game. some of the games he's played are really, really good. I don't think anybody realized he was capable of double-figure assists. must have said the same to Danny, too. Yeah. Is well, it the some, system, the reasons they, they – Well, um, what, why doesn't some players work well in one oh, some team? Well, and, that, oh, that's, what, isn't that true? Of course, question, it's very true yeah. in basketball. Yeah. Uh, it's very true in hockey. Mm. You know why? Why isn't you know why aren't Phil Kessel and and, and uh, Sagan, Sagan still here? Because right. Claude didn't like that kind of player. You know he he he's the hell with thirty six goals. You know he won't get he won't back he won't back check. You know that's Claude. You can't play for him if you don't do it. And they and they got rid of both of them. And and I mean simple as that. So but in basketball there are, you mentioned like some guys. You know, the Olenek. Olenek is always going to be a a, a teasing kind of player. Right. Um, and so is Sollinger. Um, but there were, oh yeah, there were definitely systems that uh, some guys can play in and, and other guys can't. And do you believe in change of scenery? I mean, I, I'm oh, yeah. seeing Will Middlebrooks now putting up great numbers <laughs> in spring training, <laughs> and if for some reason he ends up to be uh, I know, a 30, you gotta let it go. Guy. You gotta oh. let it go because I think they gave him plenty of chance. Did they? Yeah. I do, I, and I wanted to believe it too. Believe me. But you know, I remember reading early on. Are you familiar with Joe Sheehan? No. Okay, Joe Sheehan is SI.com, and he writes a daily, or almost a daily, it's a very frequent <clears throat> newsletter, which I recommend if you care about baseball, uh, you, you know, you can get. And um, he, he picked apart Miller Brooks, even after that first year, of uh, his swing, really? his, his uh, uh, he, he, he dissected his, his, um, his splits and his bats and everything, and said he does not think there's any long-term success of, uh, here with Middle Brooks. He, he, he absolutely identified right away. Don't get fooled by Middle Brooks. And uh, I'm just saying that's one guy and one, one baseball, you know, savant yeah. that did not like Middle Brooks. Um, I wanted it to work. Yeah, it would have been great. But uh, that ship sailed, and if he, if he has Still a let it go. Career, he was not going to do it here. Yeah. For whatever yeah. reason, it wasn't. I don't think. Now that we're on the Red Sox, yeah, uh, I'd love to ask you about Mookie Betts. Yeah, and, and how excited are you? And when you think about w how high he could get to, his peak, what's what kind of a player? I, is I, 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 it's hard not to get excited, and we all we all have to caution ourselves not to get too too excited because it's almost too good to be true good to how good people think right. he is right now but i mean look at the spring he's having on top of the, the what we saw uh you know he's capable capable of changing positions and doing very well uh, at that uh how high also you know an all-star i mean a, a a perennial all-star kind of guy i mean i think he's going to be the next well you know the next best player uh, uh, you yeah, know last year at this time he wasn't even on anyone's radar no he was he was on portland probably double a if it were, yeah. i'm not sure exactly I think he may have started where did he start a? the season did he start the season he in, in single a i'm not yeah. sure uh, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, but uh, what doesn't he do? He's, he's he's a disciplined batter. He's an excellent fielder. He uh -huh. runs. He steals bases. Uh, he seems to have the the, the right, the, absolutely the right, the right. The heads on straight. Uh, we're very, you know, I'm very, I'm very excited. But have the last three seasons made made us stupid? Boston Red Sox fans because 2000. Nothing has made sense the last three. Well, years. last year, but it made sense. See, the thing about last year. What I love, what, what was easy about last year, this was I, I used to just kept using this analogy. Remember at this time last year, who was like the second or third best team in the NBA? Indiana Pacers. At this right, time yes. last year, right. the Indiana Pacers were on target to win the East, go to the finals. People, I mean, they certainly were 50-50 <laughs> yeah. at least to go to the East right. and win the finals and get to the finals. And then it just <laughs> boom, yeah, it disappeared. Just there was no explanation, you know. And <laughs> yeah. but the Red Sox 
We had every explanation. They got men on base, they didn't bring them in. No. Next question, that was as simple as that. <laughs> they didn't yeah. bring them in. Their OBP was adequate to the task. Their, their OPS was, you know, and their, their RISP was abominable, awful. Yeah. They yeah. didn't hit and bring guys in, period. And then, you know, Poppy got, you know, rolling late and, the, you know, his numbers were Poppy, you know, um, resume Poppy padding late. letters, yeah, right. numbers, you know. Pedroia. And, and Pedroia. Right. Okay, this is it. Well, this is, now don't hit a hot button yeah, because we're all yeah. talking right, a lot. This is right. it. If he's, it, if he's healthy and he doesn't produce, we have to accept, you know, that we've, we will never see anything like what we saw. But it's not over yet. If he's healthy, let's see what happens here to get back and, you know, and have a, say, a slugging, you know, slug 450 anyway, you know, if not, mm -hmm. if not you know, more, um, and, and hit 15 home runs and, and, hit, and drive the ball. Um, you know, he still can feel God. He's a wonderful little player. He's an asset. But we had a player that was a, you know, it was a hall of, it was a, an MVP. Although yeah. I would have voted for Yukos that year, by the way. Yeah. But that, you know, that's right. another, you know, just just for the record. But explain to me 2013 because 2013 does not make any sense. Yeah. Seriously, really, Sandwiched. everything, everything oh, that makes, went, I, everything went right for it us. It was literally. Sense. It was, oh, oh yeah, it was, and oh. every ball, the ball. Well, just Theo was seven for seven with with you know off season acquisitions. Right. I think it was the number, right? With everyone, everyone hit the hit the number. Even with Mike Carp, hit the he, he hit the jackpot. Victorino, every, every yeah. single yeah. guy. Victorino, yeah, okay, Johnny. You know, they all they all contributed. No question mm -hmm. ab about that. Um, Tigers were a better team in the ALCS, but we beat them. Beat them. Tampa yeah. had when a great you, pitch. When you get the best up. version of guys that you've taken a chance on, and they all come up, you know. Black. That was. That's. It's yeah. like. Remember that was what got Belichick that first Super Bowl. Is remember he went like ten for ten on those free yeah, agents. Right. Yeah. Exactly. The Brave Bulls. Roman and Fifers right. and yeah. And and luck. Let's face it. In the first series, Will Myers <laughs> the fly <laughs> ball right. drops. Yeah. The ball yeah, doesn't right. drop. They may not win that series. And then if Torrey Hunter, a Gold Glove. All right. Yeah. He's past his prime. Okay. Unless yeah. he wouldn't mm -hmm. be in right yeah. field. All right. Yeah. But he's past his prime. But he's still a very. He's a superior defensive player. He overruns the ball. That's what happened to the Poppy home run. It was yeah. very catchable. Yeah. He overran it. It goes we over. It was, we thought his, it was going to be. It goes over his shoulder, his right shoulder, mm -hmm. as he's running this way. Oh, his left shoulder. I mean, mm -hmm. as he's running from from right to left toward the bullpen, the ball goes over the wrong. He overran the ball, and uh, thus we get that wonderful photo. You know, the Stan Grossman photo. You know, oh, but, legs but, and arms. Yeah, you know, but <laughs> right. but the fact is, he overran the ball. If he doesn't overrun the ball, that's not a home run. They don't win that game, and they don't win that series. I mean, it's. Just, well, I remember that, Napoli hit that it was that one to nothing game yeah. where Napoli they, they couldn't do anything and Napoli hit that ball to deep center against the Tigers, which was and then they were blessed all year. I mean, my favorite my favorite moment of the year was uh, the 16th in the pinch hit grand slam by Carp in the 16th inning. Oh, in, that's in, right. In Tampa. I yeah. mean, to me, I, I watched that entire game too. I said I sat on the start to finish that night. <laughs> 16 innings. You're worth a better man than yeah. we are. <laughs> the, a fact: Bob Ryan is a season ticket holder since 1991 for the Boston Red Sox. Now, were you at? Game two of the ALCS when Big Poppy hit that home run? No, as a matter of fact, I was with my grandson, taking my grandson to a music concert. Okay. And oh. I listened to that on the radio. I can say exactly oh, where I was. Must have been a great call. I was in Jackson Square in Weymouth on All my right. way home. <laughs> That's exactly where I was. Not when, that it did make an impression ball, on you. Because my, we were, we were, I consider that the most exciting moment oh, that I've been but, in my life. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I had made a commitment, you know, and we went to we went to a concert, and and, and, and you know sometimes like you know, real life, you know, it, it, it takes precedence. Yeah. So um, I, but I was at you know many of the other games in the playoffs, but not that one. I truly believe this. You may not believe it. The Red Sox fans willed that to happen. You could actually feel it. It was tangible. Well, it was, was the like, only. We are right. not going to lose. Say, I just. And then, of course, to have Big Poppy. And how does he kind of fit in the in the whole history of sport? I mean, to have a guy come up when everyone's thinking about. He needs to hit a home run. Yeah, yeah. And for right. him to do that when it's not that no, easy no. to hit a home run. No, no, no. That was a great moment, and of course, it was just setting the table for this historic World Series that he had. Uh, you know, yeah, look, he has that cap capability. He's, a, he's an old. I believe he's a Hall of Famer. I, I, I uh, uh, know what the. the how the voting is going for Edgar Martinez, who I think should be in the Hall of Fame, and and being a DH, uh, you know, is is not easy to. to, to for some people to get beyond. Uh, I hope he makes it. I, I think his power numbers will help him. Um, but I just think he's, he's, he's one of the great players of our time. And uh, uh, how much more he's got left, I don't know. One more year would be nice. Yeah. Well, uh, well, Pedro's induction, you know, it's funny. Yeah. Pedro, he, he, he's kind of been off our radar screen a little bit. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. he, he flared so bright for so long here. And then going to the Mets and sort of being off the radar screen. Do you think this will rekindle the? the I, oh, I think there'll be obviously there's going to be a lot of a good publicity attached to it, and 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 I 
think everyone's going to rise to the occasion to remind people of Pedro's greatness. Uh, every, there's always something. Uh, Dan Shaughnessy's column on Chili Davis, uh, you know, of course, right. Chili, Davis hit, good one too. T- Chili Davis hit the home run in the second inning. Hit the foul pole, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Did the, it really? Yes, didn't it say did. That in the column. It hit the foul pole. <laughs> so one foot more, and Pedro's got a, you know, a no-hitter on top of the— One of the you great— know, the, pitch, uh, One of the best— I, no, I, did, I wasn't at that game, okay? That was Friday night. Mm-hmm. I went down on Saturday. I, I, I don't know what the deal was with the Globe for me that weekend. I have no idea. You know, who can remember? 2001 or 19, whatever year it was. 99, right? 99. Yeah, 99. 99. 99. I don't know what was going on, but I went down on Saturday for the Saturday and Sunday. <coughs> and I, I chatted up David Cohn before we, I was going to write a column on Pedro. And I chatted up Cohn. That's a year. Now, Cohn had thrown his no hitter, his perfect game mm-hmm. that year, I believe. Uh, uh, was, Wells's was 97 and his was 99 I, but whatever I think mm. and he said that is the greatest game I have ever seen pitched including my own perfect game really Period. yes he Cone did said which that. I was able to include in the column Pedro I remember th- when and, you know circus when we first we, we got him I said to my wife if he's pitching I gotta go you know, if, I'm, if it's humanly possible, if I'm home, and, and whether I'm working or not working, we right. are going, we have to go to Pedro's games because you do, every night could be historic. And, you know, we're talking about back-to-back 15 strikeouts, you remember at times. Yeah. You know, I mean, those three years, 98, 99, 2000, you know, these 23 and 4, one year, he's 18 and 6 with a 1.74. Uh, his ERA is two runs below the league average. I mean, that, and, and, and in an offensive era. Right. And, and you know, the, it, it was as good a pitching, it's the best pitching in, in Red Sox history, and, period. And I think, uh, to me, the, the, one of the great individual performances in any sport at any time was coming in in relief. In 99 coming in. Well, it was amazing. And we didn't realize how hurt he was or anything. Else. No idea. And, mm-hmm. and it fits perfect relief in that game. That was a very fascinating series. Oh, my God. Remember Troy O'Leary had two home runs in a game. That's and, right. And they had that mm-hmm. big, that big uh, 19, 20 run game, whatever. But, uh, yeah, Pe- but Pedro, now there's going to be so much about Pedro. Um, uh, they, at Pedro's peak, I mean, what more would you want? He threw 97, 98. He had, the, he had a, a, a plus curve, a plus curve ball, had an A plus uh, slider, and he had the the, rain, the the standard by which all changeups were measured it was amazing. at the time. I mean, it's un, it was it was ridiculous, and and and, and he was nasty. Right. He would throw yeah. at you, and and uh, you know he kept people loose. Uh, he was uh, there was there was an, and he was fun uh, uh, and he was fun for us to have around. I mean he uh, he was such a smart guy. He really I is. I keep smart. waiting for Buckholz to throw that. Cha- I, I just want Buckholz <laughs> to throw that Pedro changeup. Don't you, you know what? Like, he, can, he has it in I'll him. Never it looks forget like he's got it in him. I remember I, I remember his debut was on an <clears throat> afternoon game of a day nighter against the Angels, and 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 and, and um, uh, uh, I remember talking to Mike Sosha after the game. This kid's changeup. He was raving about that changeup. He, yeah. he pitched maybe five innings. You know, yeah. I don't know whether they got the W or didn't. But but uh, Sosia was saying, "My God, this kid. Who's that kid? You know, they, you know what a changeup." And and that should be his calling card. Look, he's a tease. Uh, you don't um, think it's going to happen? Can't, we can't do a heart transplant. I never, with Pedro's ex- for this <laughs> I never <laughs> expect <laughs> anything. He's never thrown two hundred innings. He never yeah. thrown. Yeah. He's thrown one hundred and eighty even. I don't know. But no, not much more. He's a guy That's, very happy to be a fifth starter. Yeah, you know. And, and, well, and when you're now, at the game, it's unwatchable with yeah. the with the fiddling around he does on the yeah. mound. Yeah, the mm-hmm. only reason that he's not the worst we've ever seen is that we had Dice K. Oh, I, mean, yeah. I, I got to the point where if Dice K was pitching, go. I didn't want. I mean, I I, <laughs> right. I, I, I bring, bring a book. Right. I said, why don't they just put up on the board three and two <laughs> yeah. every batter? Put three and two up, <laughs> and then we can start then the count. We get zero and two, and you oh, yeah, 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 zero and two, and he wins. That's it. God forbid he go zero and two because he's never going to throw a strike down. I used to love going to Wakefield's games because you knew oh, one way or another oh, yeah. it was going to be. Do you remember the game Wakefield lost in Yankee Stadium, one nothing? Yes. Uh, and and uh, uh, that's do, another do one. He, threw, he struck out remember. twelve on a Sunday afternoon, yeah. and Jambi hit the foul pole. Yeah. Oh my God! Off him. Yeah. yeah. No, he I mean, was, uh, Wakefield he had, had some games. Yeah. But, you know, that 95, that, that's the greatest knuckleball pitching for two months in the history of baseball. Yeah. And I remember the game where it all ended because we were, it was like rolling dice, right? And they played Baltimore. And Baltimore roughed him up. He won the game, but Baltimore roughed him up a little bit. And you could tell it was like the was inflection it. point. Yeah, no, he, was, like, he was two and nine. The run was the, over. I think he was two and nine. It was 14 and one, and he went up 16 yeah. and eight. So yeah. he was two and seven down the stretch. And, and he never was a great postseason pitcher. Except that one game five, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. game five, and uh, you know, and, uh, oh, of course, he won both games in, in 03, right? Uh, and uh, but uh, in game five, he I mean, went to um, I'll never forget, um, he you know, the two pass balls <laughs> with Veritech yeah. winning runs on third base, oh. yeah, right? And uh-huh. he strikes out, he strikes out Sierra, it was excruciating. Now, he was so rootable, Wake, good yeah. guy, yeah. He's good, he's, great he's guy, a nice, he's a good guy. Did, did Wakefield get Francona fired? Here's my theory, oh, he. You know, well, that, that whole 200th win, yeah, that was bad. he was keeping, Frank Conner was keeping Wakefield in. 
Yeah, despite the there fact so they were many, losing games. Well, there were so of many that. things. It did. It did hurt the team. Yeah, I think, and, and the sentimentality uh, there uh, you know, was was uh, detrimental. Yeah, I do, and I was rooting for him, but it was painful. It was awful. You know, every night, and finally, he finally got it, and thank God. But still, you know, there were so many things that happened, and right down to the last, right down to the last inning in the last yeah. game. But what oh, happened to Frank Kona? It, you know, and the whole know. situation with Daniel Bard, if you remember. Yeah. You know, Daniel Bard was literally. We were at a game that he was begging. To get off the mound, he was looking in the dugout every pitch. Yeah, I don't know. Like, that. Are you yeah. serious? Yeah. You need yeah. to. And Francona wouldn't do that. What happened? I don't I mean, know because he. I'm, I consider Francona the best. Remember, up to, up to September first uh, that year, our only discussion was who's going to pitch game three. Right. It was also who's going to pitch game three. They were they were so, they were the best team in baseball. And who's going to pitch game three? And then that that spectacularly disastrous September. Um, you know, we've got other stuff has come out about you know what was going on with Francona. I think it's a little bit of everything. Uh, he was having personal problems. He was not himself, and, and the pitchers all stunk. Couldn't get a, they could, nobody could win a game. Nobody could win a game. You know, no one it wasn't up. just not him. One person. I mean, not one of them. Nobody has stepped up, and nobody nobody could win a game. Uh, and and yet they still almost you know had they gotten the playoffs, they wouldn't have done anything. But you know, it still came down to the last night and and, and the convergence of events. Now, Bob, I'm 49. So is Russ. I the only. Sports, great sports, Boston sports team of the modern era that I do know nothing about is the 1967 Boston oh, Red boy. Sox, for which Bob has a special piece of memorabilia that he keeps to this day on his desk. You and just please, please just give us. Well, I've a, got the scorecard from the you know the final game. I mean, October 167. Yeah. There were people when the Red Sox beat the Yankees in 03 and 04, excuse me, and won the World Series. There were still people saying, "My, I still feel my favorite game is that day right? ever was October 1st, 67." You have to understand the context. I mean, mm -hmm. it came. Yes, they had had a good second half of 1966. They were actually over mm -hmm. 500 after the All Star game, but they still finished last. And there was no, there was no. No one in the world was picking them to do great things in 1967. They have a new manager, Dick uh, Williams, uh, which was interesting. Uh, nobody knew how that was going to go. He famously proclaimed in spring training, we will win more than we lose, for which he was derided by the media. And, uh, and the fans said, yeah, sure, okay, give me a break. Um, and it didn't start off spectacularly well. They were still kind of kind of, uh, you know, uh, doing okay. They were above 500, which was good. Then they had a 10-game winning streak in June. And, and that was it. That. That's that, that right? was a tipping point. They came home and they were greeted yeah. at at, at uh, Logan by thousands of people uh, during for this the regular tank. season. Yes, yeah. that, really? uh, yes. It was the big. It was yeah. the best event really Holy because smokes. nothing had nothing that positive had happened in Boston uh, since. Well, in '64 they were they hung in for a little while in '64 uh, when Pesky was managing. But basically, since since they hadn't been in a pennant race literally in since 1950. And, 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 and now people were, were excited, and there was something about them. And Yaz was having the year. Right. And, and Tony C. was 22 years old, having a good year. He was living at home still. It was still the greatest story going. Lonborg was having this year on his way right. to the Psy. But still, um, it, and that, that, that brought baseball back. I mean, absolutely rekindled. I mean, uh, I, I went to my first game. Elena and I went to my wife. The then girlfriend, now wife, went to that uh, Memorial Day doubleheader. They swept the Indians, and that was the first of two of 27 games that I went up to going to uh, as a, uh, in between my junior and senior year at BC. Right. I was working at a job uh, working in Boston, and um, it, you would walk around town, and I mean seriously, I'd, you'd walk around and, and um, the, the, the transistor would be on the porch, and you could go from neighborhood to neighborhood and hear the whole Every game. House. You pull up really? the stoplight, yes. pull up the stoplight, and you'd hear the radio on the uh, next to you. And it was yeah. about radio. There were 50 games televised, roughly in those days, but mostly by Channel Five in 19. Uh, that, that, that was the television. So people followed 1967 more by the radio. Than Far they did more by the TV. radio. It was all about really? Ned Mar Ken Coleman and Ned Martin. It was all about Ken Coleman and Ned yeah. Martin, Having and then and, and newspaper. But radio, radio, radio. And um, it was all about that. Uh, and, and then it just there were so many memorable games. And, and you were and at the Tony C game and have I was a, there on foul ball. Right? Yeah, I was. I was walking. I was going to get a bleacher ticket, and I got to Kenmore Square, and a guy was uh, offering me a box seat for face value or, or maybe close to it, and I bought it. And I went. I wound up sitting just outside the screen down the third base line in the first inning. Jimmy Hall of the uh, Angels hit a, hit one, and it bounced and it rolled out right under my seat. I didn't even have to move. Really? Get a foul ball, one and only foul ball that I ever got. I still have it. It's in my office. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, but that night, that was a weird, weird night. You know, it was a first of all, Gary Bell was pitching a perfect game through the fifth. Then he was pitching a no hitter into the seventh. Meanwhile, in the fifth inning, um, uh, there was a, well, Tony C got hit in a scoreless game, and um, somewhere in there, someone threw a smoke bomb on the field. 
Really? And it held up the game for 10 minutes. And then Rico hit one to right center, and Jose Cardinal overran it, and it was a triple and scored the first run. So anyway, they're leading like 2-0 going to the seventh, and Bell's got a no-hitter going. And then Jimmy Hall hit one in the center field bleachers, 2-1, to one, and then they got another one. Anyway, they wound up winning the game 3-2, to two, and, and Hall hit another one in the ninth. But it was a weird, weird night. But you know, that was the Tony C night. And what I was month there. was that? Uh, August 18th, August, the Friday yeah. so night. And would was they have won it if Tony C hadn't been hit? Do you think they would have won it? The World Series? Yeah. Well, the, the, they would have won the World Series if, uh, 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 well, no, it's not 67. No, they lost to, they lost to uh, Gibson. It yeah, came down to strong. Gibson pitched on yeah. three days rest and, and Lomborg pitched on two days rest in Game 7. Yeah. Yeah, Lomborg pitched Games 2, 5, and 7. Gibson yeah. pitched one, four, and seven, and and uh, and Lonnie tried valiantly to pitch. He had nothing in the in the game. Uh, Julian Javier had a home run off him even, and he got beaten game seven. But they were down three to one. They won game five and six. Was when um, a lot, Gary Wazlewski was the winning pitcher in game six. But anyway, back to your whole thing about it. That the romanticism about Red. They just the dividing line in Red Sox baseball history without any question. Tom Yawkey, and I can show you. I have the thing in my uh, the clip in Sporting News in, uh, in uh, June of 1967 was telling people how. Well, we have to get a new ballpark. I can't make any money in this park. <laughs> uh, it, it's hopeless. And, and, and I, you know, we're going to talk about this, but we're going to get out of here. Uh, Fenway, I keep saying, was not this revered, iconic place. It was no. like the old sofa at Grandma's house, you know, <laughs> right, yeah. and, and uh, had no cachet, and it wasn't a baseball cathedral or anything of the sort until 1967. People were rediscovered the charms of Fenway. And you can owe it all. Yeah, the team in general, sure. Yaz, Lonborg, those two specifically, yeah. and Dick Williams. Those three people. But, of course, Rico and Scott had a great year at 303, and Reggie Smith was a, was a terrific rookie. And, and uh, you know, they got that great year out of Jose Santiago. Uh, and Dick Williams made a terrific trade to get Gary Bell at the trading deadline, without which, you know, a lot of without which is they don't win kind of thing, you know. Was, but was Yaz's 70, year was Was just, 75 still a little bit in the context of 67? Was it close enough that there was this sort of feeling or— where does 75 Well, 75 sit? was interesting because 74 was a huge disappointment. They were Got seven it. and a half. They had a seven-game lead on August 23rd in 1974. And I can still hear Daryl Johnson saying, these kids aren't going to fold. Well, those kids folded. Yeah. And, and they, it, they, they, they went into this tailspin, and they lost this Memorial Day, excuse me, Labor Day doubleheader yeah. to the Orioles. Right. And, and uh, it, was, it was a crusher. And um, they, they, they collapsed down the stretch. So, you know, there was this feeling of, uh, but, ah, but in September they brought up these two kids, Fred Lynn, who went 419 in September of 74, yeah. and Jim Rice yeah. from Pawtucket. And so there was this glimmer of hope in 75. But uh, the other thing is Rick Wise had, been tr had, had done nothing in 74, was hurt all mm -hmm. year. And he comes out, he's healthy, he won 19 games in 75. He was yeah. 19 and 12 in, in 75. Right. And, um, of course, and Lynn had the, you know, the miracle and, and, year. And, 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 and then Rice, Rice got but, hit. But there's your – Rice gets yeah. – Vern Rule, Vern Rule. Hits him with a pitch. I know. Something around the long run. September 9th, September 10th. Yeah. He's done for the year. You cannot tell me that somewhere in those seven games, Rice wouldn't have had a, I, I a hit or two. Because yeah. who played? So Yaz had to go back to left field. Who played? For, oh, uh, uh, Scott. Cooper. Oh, Cooper. Cooper. Right. So yeah. you would have had. You would have had you would have Yaz at first and Rice and Rice left. and left and and, and, uh, and you know in the won. games we would have had DH would have yeah, Cooper yeah. could have DH'd or whatever yeah um, but it was still a spectacular series was, the game that kills you everybody talks about this game two. Lee it takes the lead Brister. into the ninth inning in game two. And, um, you know, this is why the Reds were the Reds. Johnny Bench, Johnny Bench uh, went the other way with him. He had a double. Yeah. Uh, the, it started the uh, you know the Red, the Reds rally and and they they pulled the game two out. You know, Louis, Louis you know was masterful in game one. Louis shuts right. him out, beats him in game one. But game two was was cool. And then of course my favorite game, one of my favorite games of all time was game Louis Louis game four when he threw 161 pitches oh, and had nothing. Can had nothing. Imagine, can you imagine Clay Buckholz? He had nothing. <laughs> Throwing 161. He had, he had, he had nothing but moxie <laughs> in the video field game. Dead. Mediocre yeah. fastball, uh, really? flat curve ball. He somehow held him and he and he Today's shut him out the last five innings. And I can still see Harry Coyle, you know, the famous director, what, and, and he was just kept zeroing in on Louis, that Fu Manchu, and it was a hot night, and it was, and the water just pouring off him, <laughs> just pouring off Louis at that, that Fu Manchu. That whole series was That was, hot. to me, all yeah. the things that Louis ever did, uh, that was his man, that was his shining moment to somehow find a way to beat the, that great right. team with that great lineup with nothing and, and, and through 161 pitches in doing so. So I have another question. It's Reds-related. Can I, can I ask oh, it? So sure. Rob Manfred mm -hmm. seems to be, these commissioners seem to be wanting to sort of distinguish themselves, let's call it, from their predecessors. Adam Silver got handed, I mean, in an unfortunate way, the... The, 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 Silver, I mean, the right. Sterling thing was, a, was amazing. on a platter. And, yeah. and he ne there's no human being who's ever handled the situation as well as I think Adam Silver did. But Manfred's looking to distinguish himself as well. 
pace of play. Yeah. He's now looking at uh, 28 man rosters, but yeah. the big Pete one is Rose. Pete Rose, right? Pete Rose. Well, um, I'm 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 anti Rose. You are. Oh, totally anti Rose. But you're for the the steroid guys. Well, I'm not, with, no, no, uh, I designation. The, I haven't voted for okay. the steroid guys, right. but so I keep we'll saying that, that I'm, in, I'm 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 reserving the right to change my mind okay. by by recognizing the futility of trying to be the judge and jury. I'm still trying to be one of these guys trying to be the judge and jury. Right. And 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 it's it's getting more and more wearing and frustrating. Mm -hmm. And 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 I may have to concede that it's a losing battle, but I don't have to do it yet. The battle goes on. I got two more years on McGuire, right? Mm -hmm. uh, right. Uh, all right. Yeah. Now, um, Rose. Rose. The betting thing. Uh, there's there's lots of interesting arguments pro and con, but when you read the arguments about why it is maybe not equally as bad to be betting on your team as against your team, but the fact of the matter is betting on your team means if you don't do it every night, which he didn't, it was known that he did not bet when Bill Gullickson pitched. It was known that he manipulated oh, okay. the bets. He was telling the, the, the also betting in general, okay. And who's to say that this didn't happen? We don't know. Uh, you get in trouble. You get you to lose. You have to. You, the, the, the bookies own you now. The 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 the, the, mm -hmm. the, the bad guys own you. Uh, it, it's it's just bad policy. It's just and and the fact is, we'll never know. I thought Joe Sheehan once again. I recommend this guy. He's a really Joe clear Sheehan. thinker. And, and Joe Sheehan wrote this. He's and he went on. It was really great the way he presented it. Um, he's he's uh, he, he talked about some dumb managers. Okay, Ned mm -hmm. Yost. You know, he, he's... <laughs> yeah. and, and, of course, <laughs> and, of course, the, 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 the worst manager <laughs> no. yeah. of the last, Bobby you know, quarter Bell. century who, who actually succeeded almost, Ron Washington. You know, I right. mean, yeah. okay. Right. He said, when they do their dumb things, you don't have to worry about intent. They're honestly doing mm. their best. <laughs> they're trying their best. They just don't know what right. the hell they're doing. Now, this is his opinion. Yeah. You know, you know, you may be a Ron Washington fan. Right. He's a wonderful fellow, by the way. Nice man. Okay. And Ned Yost appears to be a nice guy, too. But he's a bad manager. And, and Okay. He said, but now you've got a guy that's betting on games. You can't know what his motivation is for the dumb things, that, for the, some of the things that he does. Overusing certain guys, maybe, because he, he, needs to, he needs to win tonight to make up for last night's loss. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe he's leaving, you know, oh, God knows what. Not bringing playing, in the left. Playing somebody. Not bringing in the left. Right. Right. Exactly. All kinds of things. And you, have, <clears throat> you don't know what his motivation is. This is, sure. this is wrong. I mean, this is it's so. So it torpedoes the whole integrity. And, I, and so, and, and, and you know, uh, as um, uh, John Dowd is on record already right now, you know, John Dowd, the John Dowd report, he hasn't reconfigured his life, quote unquote, the way he was told to by Bart Giamatti. He still, my opinion, he may very well love baseball more than any man or woman on this earth. He may, to this moment, he may, mm -hmm. but he loves gambling more. And he proves that almost every day of his life. No, don't let him in. Okay, I have crazy talk okay. every once in a while. All right, I want to bring this up. I bring this up. <laughs> Mention your book, 1973, graphic. that Celtics Knicks, that the refereeing was just game, outrageous. Game four. Yep. Okay, outrageous, and you kind of implied, you know, oh, there I could be you something. Did you see what I wrote at the time? Yeah, oh, brother. Something fishy. Ben Dreith in 1976, the Raiders. Okay, so I have a great friend who's from Europe and a great soccer fan, and he says, you know, you Americans, he said, every time in Europe a, a, a referee makes a call that is iffy, we figure that he's either on the take yeah. or someone has his family. Okay. But in America, <laughs> you know, everyone the referees do bad calls and they're like, oh dup -a -dup -a -dup -dup. All right. And just <laughs> so if we're going to have Pete Rose, if we're gonna talk about Tim Donahue, all right, mm -hmm. we can't think that those are isolated situations that how much corrupt ref how many corrupt referees have we had over the course of the years that we don't know about? Question. You know, if we're going to talk about Pete Rose, where's the investigation? Well, well, we don't referees? know. Well, that's a great question. I don't have any. I mean, uh, that's a very valid point. Uh, this, this worry about uh, umpires goes back to the 19th century. I can, I can tell you, in the 1880s, mm -hmm. there was a lot of worries about uh, corrupt umpires, uh, and and you know, they thought they weeded them out. I don't know. The Donahue thing is very troubling because you know the other guy that was the recipient of all those phone calls on the night of the game, Scott Foster, is still working. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And then it was all that stuff about Dickie Bavetta, you know, and, and I, I, I know him, I like him, he's a, he's a sweet fella, uh, you know, but there are people to say, you know, he was the commissioner's guy. And, and you know, that, that, that when they had games that they needed to have series, you know, back evened up or, you know, to go six games or longer, you know, this is the allegation. That, 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 that the uh, cynics and the, and the conspiratorial thinkers of the world say, uh, you know. That, well, how much uh, noise have you heard over the last 45 years about that? I mean, you've been not in that much. The guy, no? the guy that in my time, you know, which I would define as 1970 to 1989, my time, you know, mm -hmm. when I was really totally connected <clears throat> to the league. I haven't been totally connected to the league since then. Totally. 
was you worried about Mendy? Everybody yeah. worried about Mendy Rudolph. Oh, is that right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Back then, everybody yes. worried about Mendy. I mean, you know, if you're going to worry about it, the whispers, were about Mendy. Mendy's long gone. He's gone to his final reward. So you know, we can talk openly about yeah. Mendy. But it was, it, it was, but a lot of that was just with cynicism. You know, uh, some of it may very well have been uh, anti-Semitism, by the way, in his yeah. case. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that that he was the guy they whispered about. That some people didn't trust Mendy. Auerbach uh, didn't trust him. You know, and, and, <laughs> but but Auerbach and Borgia didn't get along. But Red yeah. never accused Borgia of being anything other than incompetent. You know, yeah. I mean, right. in a, you know that, that was that wasn't uh, no great point, and it's not used brought up very much now. As far as you know, as far David as, Stern buried that, but as he far as, buried that, he was brilliant in yeah. In, I mean, in, and and how Scott Foster still walking around. As far as I know, he's still working. Yeah. I, once again, I'm not paying total attention to the league the way I used to. But last I looked, he was still working, and he was the other guy that was the recipient of all these calls on these nights of games yeah, from Donahue. Right. So yeah, you got to worry about this kind of stuff. And and referees, you know, referees. I always say, you know, and 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 uh, I, I'm probably mentioned. I don't even know if I mentioned in the book. I think I did, but somewhere, you know. Referees are so important in basketball that when you're covering a game and you don't mention the referees when they oh, deserve yeah, to be mentioned mention because they do two things every single night. They determine who's going to play and how the game's going to be played. Right, right. And so they're very important, and I say they're at least as important as a good player in determining the outcome of the game. Maybe not a superstar, right. but a good player. I mean, a, 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 a guy who goes out and gets uh, 12 points, you know, and uh, they're important that in, in, in the – face of the game you, you know all these all these college games that are going on now um, so many of them start off and all of a sudden a, a valued, <laughs> valued player has got two fouls which is on the bench for the rest of the half and after five minutes dumb stupid ticky tack fouls or stupid calls or just incompetent calls or out of position calls or you know they're very important yeah. Take the transition game away from a team and make them play right. half court. So in honor, since we're talking about the NCAA and the, the basketball tournament, uh, in honor of getting restarted tonight, you wrote a column a couple weeks ago about the, your relationship with the NCAA. Oh, yeah. and you, you described it as it's something like being involved with a hooker. Yeah, I, I have a chapter. <laughs> I said to love college sports is to be in love with a hooker. <laughs> right. And, 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 and anybody that doesn't understand that, anybody thinks that, that, that – uh, it's all about student athleticism and it's all about amateurism and it's not about money and it's not about eligibility and it's not about uh, winning and it's not about, uh, you know, um, is, is naive. And, but it's a system that we clearly as, as Americans in, want. We, are, we, we have this as part of our smorgasbord. We have this giant smorgasbord of sporting, of, uh, sporting uh, delect, uh, you know, de with delicacies, okay? Yeah. And one of them is unique to us. Most of them are available in some form of in the rest of the world, but one of them is hours and hours alone, and that's college sports at the highest level, with right. with 100,000 seat stadiums and 25,000 seat arenas, right. such as exist in at Kentucky and in um, like Tennessee and in Brigham Young, uh, uh, 25,000 seat arenas, uh, and and where. In addition to educating our, the youth, we are also in the business and big business of entertaining you and me, right. the masses. Whether you know, and that we and we as part of our smorgasbord table. In so doing, in order to put the best possible product on the field, and 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 for as many people as want to take part in it to take part in it, there have to be compromises. All kinds of compromises. Now, uh, the, the sham is they got this rule book, which literally is that thick, the NCAA of stupid book, stuff. Right. It is the gospel truth, by the way. When I first heard it, I, I said, you know, come on, this is facetious. It is true that up until very recently, the latest edition of the book, yes, you could give somebody a bagel. But no, you couldn't give them the cream cheese. <laughs> now, when I first heard that, yeah, right. I know. I know. Now, now, there was a, uh, it, it's it, but it's true. It was honestly true. Well, and there was so there was so many petty dick. You can't give a kid a ride in the rain back to the dorm. You know, the coach, right. the coach can't do that. You know, that's an impermissible benefit. Uh, the, the cream cheese was an impermissible benefit. Uh, but meanwhile, we'll you know, watch tonight. Meanwhile, <laughs> people go to schools with altered transcripts, with the benevolent help of corrupt high school people in all over the country, and and, and right. corrupt assistant coaches. Boost Boosters funnel money in different ways to players. They've been doing it for 50, 60 years or more, okay, um, uh, uh, in all kinds of ways. No-show jobs, all kinds of ways. Uh, sham summer courses, online courses right. now is the very sneaky way. Uh, and countless things, keeping guys eligible, uh, and, and, and women perhaps very yeah. definitely in, in basketball sure. um, in the same way. And, and, and this is the system we have. So, right. you know, you guys said there were 68 teams in the tournament. And I say no fewer than 60 of them, you don't want to know how they got there or yeah. how to stay in there or how right. to play. I, I, now, is that, am I exaggerating? Not by much, 
Yeah. It, maybe I, I'll, I'll stick with 50. Yeah. And I'll name you one that I, you know, I, I, I doubt very much. No, I wouldn't. No, I'm not going to go there. I'm not yeah. because I don't trust them anymore either. So I'm not going to oh, say. Oh, I know. I, know I don't trust them anymore. Right. There's course, reason not yeah. to trust them. Yeah. So, but let me just say one guy that everybody reviles for very good reason in a lot of ways. I write about him in my oh, book. Oh, yes. Great chapter. Write about him in my book because he's one of the most, you know, you, you love him or hate him. And, 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 but there's one thing he never did. Never cheated. Bob, Bob Knight. Knight. Yeah. Knight drove him off. He drove him off. You know, they couldn't, didn't want to play for him. But he right. didn't cheat. And if you stayed, you were glad. If you stayed. Now, granted, his transfer rate was astronomical. People didn't want to. <laughs> yeah. okay. Larry Bird. Larry Bird. <laughs> no, no. Larry had nothing to do with it. Oh, no. Don't collude Larry. Right. Larry never even met Knight when he was right. there. They never oh, spoke. Oh, right. That's true. That right. had nothing to do. That was, right. that was Larry's social awkwardness, social right. inferiority. Um, that He was out of place. At Oh, no. Knight told me personally, great regret. I, 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 I admit I made a mistake. I didn't stop him. I, I didn't need him. Right. I didn't think, hey, kids, yeah. that, That's a team, by the way, that lost one game. When Scott May broke his wrist, and, they, and if they had Larry Bird, they weren't losing that game. No, no. So he paid the price. Yeah. He said, I didn't go after the kid. But anyway, it's, that's college sports. But I'm, I said, but I'm going to show you the card, my Enablers Anonymous card. You know, <laughs> in my wallet. I love We're the competition. I know. We're going to watch. But I mean, we've made out, you, you got yeah, it. It's like being, it is. It's like being it's in love a with a line. Hooker. It's got to love the line. The sausage factory. The sausage factory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That too. Well, that's. That's the that quickest so hour in the history. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, needless to say, we're, we're inviting him back, whether he comes or not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we want to thank Bob Ryan for this wonderful hour. We want to thank his beautiful wife, Elaine, for joining him here in Brookline. I um, want to thank everyone behind the scenes uh, for their great work. Thank you, Russ Stevens and Uncle Joe McLaughlin. My name is Scott Kerman. Have a great night. Guests come over, you clean the house. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Look, the big dig for all we say has. Oh, I think it's beneficial. For this area. I think it's beneficial. Yeah, I yeah. do. And let's not talk about billions of dollars because billions of dollars ten years from now is going to be totally different. No, I just.